from the peanut gallery. Um, really? Yeah. Let, let me. As as I'm waiting for all the the gears to spin and we go live, uh, Master Procrastinator over on Discord uh, asks you, Ian, uh, warm up question before the show: Who designed the hungry minspec potato logo for the channel? I, I love that that logo. I'm curious myself. Oh yeah. So, so I mean, the first logo for the channel was just a potato saying min spec, and that's actually derived from I think an Intel DX9 presentation from years ago. Really bad quality. And then just somebody who watches the channel messaged me out of the blue and said, hey, I did this for you. If you want the full resolution, let me know. And I said, that's great. Here, have some money. That's fantastic. If you've got any other ideas, let me know. Uh, Damn, that's awesome. It, it's, I, I was at the point of thinking, you know, do I go onto something like Fiverr and try and hire graphic designers to do something a bit more detailed? Because I, I, am, I am a Luddite when it comes to... Uh, comes comes down to artistic methods well i, I want to know coder, what kind of potato is it and do you have a favorite potato so the russet potato it I, looks like I a russet to me idaho potato it? the the thing that always comes up is that when i mentioned that the uk doesn't have tater tots what yeah that's, yeah that's, that's so the response yeah. <laughs> doesn't make any it's, sense uh, whenever i come to the u.s it's always let's go out, let's get some buffalo wings, let's get some tater tots. But as you guys know, nobody's been traveling for so long. <laughs> it's been seventeen months since I've been to the US. I can't, I can't wait to come and get my fill wait, of food. So you can't get tater tots at all in the entire UK. Well, I mean, you can make them, and there's some like American restaurants that you know are literally bad diners, most of them. Oh, oh man, I didn't yeah. even think about that. Yeah, like American, they go out to the American restaurant. Well, I, I guess I, I would have assumed if they were like, hey, you know what? We should try American food. Oh, let's go to McDonald's. <laughs> like, <laughs> anything fast food is just American food to me. I just was just, maybe I could like move to the UK and start my own chain of like tater tot, like fast food restaurants. It's just nothing but tater tots and... Yeah. Something other uniquely American. Well, I mean, tater tots are uniquely American. So, well, and there's a place. It, it, I was just gonna say there's a place in Berkeley that uh, uh, was just pretty much all kinds of poutine. You know, we've talked about <laughs> poutine before. You I, know? So I, I can imagine yep. the same kind of thing where you, you go over to the UK and you just have every kind of variation of tater tot. Uh, yeah, I'd be down. I think I saw that too. I, I saw it at we were at a reggae festival and they had and I should have bought some. I didn't. <laughs> The, 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 the thing with Taylor Tots in the UK is you guys have had the culture for so many decades, centuries around them. Bring them just as a new thing straight into the UK. People be like, huh, what's this? You know, just just give me regular chips or mash. Yeah, but I mean, you know, I, the part of the marketing, I think, is you dress it up with American flags and like, you know, uniquely, <laughs> yeah, you, you like, wow, real you know, it's American. It must be, you know, and then they're like, what, you, tater tots? You, oh, yeah. You, you can get a side of uh, firearms. They, serve these, they serve these at the White House. This is like go. our royalty eats the tater tots. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> but, then, but then the market for them goes up and down every four years. Yeah. Right? yeah. Okay. But, you know, it's just oh, kind of yeah. like <laughs> the whole thing of like, you know, the Americana, I think, is, is big around the world these days, so. But uh, hey, it, uh, Internet, if you tuned in, we have a very special guest for you, of course, Dr. Ian Cutters, Tech Tech Potato, awesome person, smartest guy in the room when uh, all the journalists are gathered. So uh, I'm interested. Ian, we got on at the last minute because there was a ton of news. We're going to be talking about Intel uh, saying nanometer, schmanometer, uh, got, got all kinds of new technologies and uh, also kind of lay of the land. They talked a little bit. They showed pictures of sort of Meteor Lake. And I, I, I don't think they showed, uh, they may have shown a, a shot of Alder Lake, but they showed um, a little bit of Meteor Lake. So we are going to pick Ian's brain because, you know, he actually knows what he's talking about. So uh, this is going to be super exciting. And yeah, we'll, uh, also, tater tots. Tater yeah. tots well, well, and actually, um, <laughs> my my wife Lindsay's in the chat. She she's asking you, Ian, have you heard of tachos? What? It, tater tot tacos? Uh, no, no, nachos. Tater tot nachos. Oh, no. So uh, you know, imagine all the you just swap out the chips for the uh, the tater tots, and you got tachos. They're actually pretty good. 
that's, 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 that's the thing. Mexican food isn't really a thing here uh, either. Yeah. Uh, well, you know, Ian, so <laughs> you, you have to time your next trip to the U.S. to go to a county fair. I don't know if you've ever gone to an American <laughs> oh, no, county you'd fair. You'd have a heart attack. <laughs> but that's yeah, like, you definitely like need to take him he like needs a, to, to, to go on a stretcher. and no, like, You just take a, a baby attack. aspirin before you go in to like the thin the blood a little bit. Then you get like you will just sort of like it's like it's like level the end level boss for <laughs> For America, yeah. is, is that you yeah. have to? You also have to fast a couple of days beforehand. It's just oh you would be, you would be, you would, yeah, you would have lots of stories. You would have everybody because it really is just <laughs> the height of like, yeah, I, I, yeah. You just deep fry whatever you want deep fried. They'll do it. You can literally bring anything and they'll deep fry it for you. Uh, well, they, they already they have, have their own there. stuff. Yeah, but it's, we have Scotland for that. Oh, <laughs> okay. Well, <laughs> yeah, they do have that blood thing, don't they? Some kind blood of blood pudding thing. Yeah. No. Uh, uh, also, deep fried Mars bars. Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 Snickers here. Got everything. Twinkies, deep fried Twinkies. We're gonna sound like Forrest Gump here. Oh man. Deep fried. I'm already hungry. <laughs> Ice cream. <laughs> a county fair is like a box of chocolates. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah so we're, we usually save the food talk for the end because we get closer to lunch. Uh, let's kick this off because I. I I want to hear from Ian. We got we got a lot to talk about with the Intel stuff. You ready to do this? All right, let me. I got to get everything ready uh, because yeah, flying by the seat of my pants <clears throat> here. I think I think I'm ready. Let's do it, Gordon. All right. I got to make sure I got this right. Uh, <laughs> In this episode of The Full Nerd, Intel says nanometer, schmanometer, and we're back! Crap. Oh, dang. There we go. Oh, okay. Yeah. Good enough. <laughs> Welcome to The Full Nerd, episode 185. I'm your host, Gordon Maung, with a very special guest, Dr. Ian Cutras of Tech Tech Potato. Hey, everyone. Good to see you all again. And Adam Patrick Murray is controlling the uh, horizontal and vertical. Uh, I'm excited to have Ian on, uh, not only to talk about tater tots and, and his lack of, uh, but <laughs> yeah, uh, I've, I've, I think I've only get, gotten to meet you once uh, at CES, Ian, I, I think that's what it was, but uh, glad to have you here. This, this is your first time on the full nerd proper, uh, or proper maybe is, means something different to you, but yeah, the, the, the show, the, the full show you're here, I'm, I'm, I'm excited. Thank you for, uh, for coming on. No, I, I usually hang out in the comments, annoying Adam, so this is a bit of a change. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I think we met at CES a couple of years ago. Uh, Gordon pulled me aside after a Lisa Sue interview, and we were speaking AMD, I think, at the time. Yep. 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 And yeah, that was a good time. Today, of course, it's all about Intel, though. And the, the thing I think I, I want to kick off with, uh, and that is probably most people on the internet are reacting to, especially on Twitter, because, you know, they love to react to everything, is Intel basically saying, yeah, that whole nanometer thing, that doesn't mean anything. Um, I, and I, I, so I'll break it in for people who don't know. Basically, we've gone from uh, 45 nanometer, 32, 22, 14, 10, 10, super fin. Now it's just Intel 7, Intel 4, Intel 3. Is this into now? I know everybody's going to say, I, I'm going to play devil's advocate here, Ian. Intel is losing to TSMC, and so they need to just change the definition of what a nanometer is. Is that is that the take? <laughs> what what would you say to those people oh. that are all saying that? Well, it's it, it comes down to what do, what what does that number actually mean? I mean. You, like me, every time we talk about these processes, we always have to say it's just a name. It doesn't actually measure anything physical in that product. That stopped happening, I guess, around 22 nanometer, the very first FinFETs. So it used to be a number based on a 2D transistor design. FinFETs meant that we went 3D, so they kind of kept scaling down the number as if it was a 2D design, you know, an effective 2D transistor. And then it got to the point where going from, say, you know, 32, 22, 14, these were big jumps in process design every time. And then they started getting harder. So everybody started doing these sort of half steps, half nodes, where they would just tweak something 
the node itself would be modular and say have new libraries, new design rules to eke out another 5% performance rather than a full node that might be 25%. What Intel did when it was doing those sort of half nodes, those mini jumps, they put a plus on their number. That's why we had 14 plus, 14 plus plus, 14 plus plus plus. Everybody else decided to just keep decreasing the number because they were behind anyway. At the time when Intel had 14, TSMC and Samsung were behind. And then when it felt like Intel was going to go to 10, TSMC and Samsung were what, back at 16. So it felt like they they were behind. So TSMC, Samsung, all kept decreasing that number anyway, regardless of whether it was a full node or a half node or transition or something in between. So now TSMC and Samsung are at seven nanometer, TSMC's at five, just because the number kept decreasing. So Intel said, well, hang on. TSMC seven nanometer density is about 100 million transistors per square millimeter, and so is our 10. So let's realign the numbers and play the same game that everybody else is doing, which I think is fair from a perspective of, well, let's just, if you if, don't think about products and products, we all know that Intel's 10 nanometer products have been hit and miss. But if we just look at the process node from the point of view of, hey, I run a factory that manufactures these chips and I want to sell my chips. I want to sell this process to people to design chips on. You want to have parity. The problem, because they're numbers, is that people will order them numerically. You know, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, that's the list. And you, even though the numbers don't mean anything, you need to at least be aligning with everybody else. And I think Intel, with their new Intel 7, meant, is meant to be the equivalent transistor density as TSMC's 7. And then we go into... Uh, Intel 4 is going to be roughly the same as TSMC 5. That's Intel playing the game a little bit. And then Intel 3, TSMC 3, Intel 20A, TSMC 2, or something along those lines. From my perspective, I just think it realigns Intel. And if you just completely exclude all of the, well, the products don't work on 10 nanometer or they've had difficulty and Intel's having trouble with executing and just focus on, let's align and the naming for parity for our customers, then that's where this makes sense. Now, I, I, I know you're saying on a certain level, okay, they're calling it Intel 7, Intel 4, Intel 3, but they're not saying nanometer because nanometer means nothing. But then in 2024, they're coming out with 20A, and A means angstrom, which does mean something. <laughs> so that, that argument doesn't... I think I said in my video that I published about it, I'm not sure whether we should put, be putting nanometers in front of Intel 7, Intel 4, because they weren't in the marketing. But without something else, it sounds weird. Yeah, no, it's going to, it's, it is really going to be, uh, going to get, it's going to be really hard to refer to that. And then you're right. I mean, how do you, why is it nanometer doesn't mean anything in nanometer, but suddenly it means something in angstroms? Because, because, so for people who haven't caught up, they're going to do angstrom which is the next step down from nanometers and they apparently think that's yeah. a valid measurement but is do you, why even do that why isn't there a chance that like tsmc or samsung well we got 10a you know it's, it, what does uh, it mean right i mean well so so the dram industry with their process nodes when they went when they went down from 20 nanometer dram or um flat nan flash they reduced it Instead of saying, saying 19, 18, 17, they said 10x or 1x, then 1y, then 1z. Now it's 1 alpha. So everybody has you know different letters to describe what they're doing, and it's very hard to order them unless you actually know what they are. With logic nodes like Intel 7, like TSMC 7 nanometer, you know what a number is. Therefore, you can try and order them just based on the number. And... I'm I'm looking at the comments on my article on my video on this, and it's still very clear that people don't realize that Intel 10 is the same density as TSMC 7, and we're continually having to describe that these are names, not actual dimensions. Uh, IBM, a few months ago, promoted a 2 nanometer chip. That's 2 nanometer, not 2 nanometer. 
And I had to keep explaining, no, it's not five atoms wide. <laughs> it's it's just a name. And that's going to be a problem until we move to names like, you know, the Intel potato process node, the Intel, you know, uh, lake nanometer node. You know, they've got lots of names they can pick from. <laughs> and I just want to take this chance to point out, uh, Ian's got a fantastic channel, uh, Tech Tech Potato. Uh, right here on YouTube. Please go there, like, and subscribe to it because you will learn awesome things like uh, about DDR5. I don't want to derail this whole thing, but uh, you bring up a really good point because I remember maybe three years ago, Intel had this big to-do in San Francisco and they're like, hey, you know what? Our process, look, we're as, as good as, uh, as Samsung is, but they're using a smaller number. So you somehow think they're better we think we should go to density because, you know, transistor density is, yep. is probably a better description of, you know, of how, how, how many transistors you can get there clearly than this, this made up nanometer thing. And of course, nobody adopted it and they couldn't get any traction. Why not go to a density thing? So it was funny. The, the metric that Intel suggested, um, you and I both know David Shaw from Wikichip who used to work at IBM, at IBM's research facilities. He's been in the industry years. Intel at the time said that this has be, this was a previous metric used two, three decades ago. And David turned around and said, huh, I've never heard of it. <laughs> but it's transistor density sounds easy to calculate. Millions of transistors per millimeter squared. How can you get that wrong? You know, but the point is that the transistors are made out of gates. And different processes use different amount of gates to build their transistors. And then there are things like contact over active gate and lots of different special functions that you can use to help reduce your transistor size. But different fabs, different foundries calculate their peak transistor density differently. So I think the metric Intel suggested was, you know, take 60% density of, you know, an uh, the equivalent of an SRAM cell and then 40% of a flip-flop, or maybe it's the other way around, but either way, that's a representative density that you should be thinking about. But other founders were like, well, we're just going to quote our highest density libraries, right? The ones that we use for low power, low IO. But then when we're talking about chips, we're almost always talking about the high performance, leading edge, um, you know, whether it's AMD 64 core, Intel 40 core, they're all made pretty much using high, uh, high performance libraries, which are half as dense. So if you're going to talk about a process node by the peak transistor density, how relevant is that to the chips that you're actually going to talk about? And it gets very messy, at least with this nanometer metric, it's a number and people understand numbers and it's still, it's, it's, it's the, Worst, best of a bad situation, I guess. I, you know, and, and I, because I, 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 as a as a journalist, I I like to flail on my industry and myself because I, I I do think some of this is because I remember you know originally it was like hey yeah this is fourteen nanometer you know asterisk Intel says their fourteen nanometer is as dense as you know Sam, uh, Samsung's ten yeah. nanometer right. And then after about three months, it's like, yeah, I'm just going to stop saying that because it just sound it sounded like you were being an apologist for Intel almost, yep. you know, and it was hard. Yeah. And then what I see now is everybody's just like, you know what, I'm just going to, people don't even, they'll say TSMC seven nanometer, which is awesome because the products are awesome based on it. Yep. But it's just sort of like, it's sort of like a little bit of laziness of journalism because you don't want to go through that whole explainer. And frankly, there's definitely some mainstream yeah. coverage that doesn't really understand it either. So, well, I mean, I think we're going to spend the next couple of months saying Intel seven used to be 10 enhanced super thin. And then eventually we're just going to, we're, you and I are going to stop saying it because we can just say Intel seven versus somebody else's seven and people will understand it and it makes our lives a bit easier and to be honest it does make marketing lives a bit easier i know people want to hate on marketing for the sake of marketing but hey these are people too and some of them are actually quite nice and are honest regardless of what gets put out into the press and um i mean i don't know about you i've actually been advocating for this change for a while uh on the Anand, on the Anand Tech YouTube channel, I actually did a video two years ago because I looked it up today, 
saying <laughs> Intel shouldn't have gone plus, 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 plus. They should have called it 14, 13, 12, 11, then 10, 9, 8, 7, 6. And that would have made sense. And I was that was two years ago. And I've been advocating it to Intel to do something with the naming ever since. And I know um, lots of analysts in the industry have, Pat Moorhead, I think the Tyrius guys as well, because it just makes sense from an alignment perspective. Now, the key question is, can they execute in 23, 24, 25? Are these going to be pushed out? Is there, Would there have to be another realignment further down the line based on technology? But don't forget, Intel at one point was two, three years ahead in density. And now they're kind of two, three years behind, however you want to measure that. So if Intel fails again and they'll be six years behind, you know, fingers crossed they won't because we do love competition. If they then realign back, yeah, that'll look a bit fudgy. Yeah. So given, given this one, with the naming at least, and let's see if they execute. And, you know, Pat Gelsinger has lots of enthusiasm. Um, you know, it's... And I, I've, I've spoken to uh, Dr. Anne Kelleher, who now runs their technology division, doing all this sort of roadmap stuff. And uh, she is a sort of person, I feel, who knows how to get stuff done and will come down hard if you don't. Her history is in managing, is in uh, technology production and managing fabs. And she's been at uh, Intel for a while. She, I think, I think she's, she's got her mind in the right set. And as long as, you know, they solve the problem of physics, which is difficult. Um, but also, what well, one thing I should point out is we all know that TSMC's, TMC has been executing regularly, consistently for a good five, six years now. And the way they do that is they modul modularize their production. You know, the next node, they bring something new in to replace something else. And over time that builds up, Intel's moving to that model. Especially when they hit Intel 7, um, sorry, Intel 4 with EUV, they're moving to a more modular model with their process node design. The reason why 10 didn't work to begin with is because they tried to do four or five things at once. And if you've ever done process node design, you know it's it's there's a thousand degrees of freedom, and you draw one too far, and it puts everything else out of alignment. So by moving to a more modular aspect, rather than trying five things at once, which hasn't worked, they're going to be doing it piece by piece by piece, which is how TLC has done it, and then you know orthogonal to that packaging and stuff. So, so you think there's a? It sounds like there's a better chance for them to execute because clearly. Uh the intel of the last few years is not the intel I remember from 10 years ago or 15 years ago where they had yeah. always executed, but they they really sort of fumbled really badly, and you sort of feel like th by going to a TSMC modular uh, de design, they can really hopefully execute. I mean, there's there's a better chance of them executing because I, I, it feels like a lot of the problems with intel is as a, as a, as a consumer of it, it's like, uh, you know, you make you, you do all the big talks and then I get this. And that's been the problem the last few years. I, I think part of the problem is that when we get a product, when we get a CPU, when we test it, um, that's the culmination of 16 different R&D teams, right? <laughs> the process could be absolutely fine, but the microarchitecture could have issues. Right, or you could have a bad process and a really good microarchitecture, and then you know the GPU, the I/O, the packaging could be you know a poor packaging play, and it's only when those things kind of align right do you get a really good product at the end. And if you think about really really good products, how many have Intel had over the last fifty years? Four, maybe five. So, it's. Semiconductor industry is cycles. It goes around every so you know every every so often. Companies do really well. The question is, can you keep yourself afloat during a downturn? And the argument now is, Intel has come out of a downturn. Part of that is Pat Gelsinger. Part of that is the new hires. I think, I mean, from from the perspective of I follow these companies closer than just the products. My opinion here going forward is, can they put the people in place 
for the next 10 years, right? They've had to do some rehiring recently, which is great if you want to hire people in their late 50s, early 60s. They'll stick around for another five years, maybe 10, but you got to put people in there long term. And that's it's in Intel is it. I think it's all got to be about the corporate structure and the corporate climate and the culture inside the company. Um, and hopefully the new people can do that. And I say hopefully because it all boils down to competition. We want a competitive landscape. We don't want one company treading over others because that means we end up with four cores for a decade. <laughs> yeah, well, no, that's and actually we we have some good chat in the uh, the YouTube chat uh, about that too. You know, some people are saying, "Hey, Zen Four is going to come out and and kick its butt." Some people are saying, "Hey, Intel's got some interesting things that, that we need to keep an eye on." So, if anything, competition is uh, is what makes the world go around. So, <laughs> I'm happy for that. Yeah, it gives us better products at cheaper prices. Usually, not always, but generally does okay uh, can you imagine a point if we stayed at 16 cores for the next 10 years <sighs> i it is possible yeah we're, we're on two generations now it could be three it could be four on the amd side hmm. will we hold if amd does that in light of them being very competitive will we hold them to the same standard or to the same you know, opinions that we've had of Intel over the last decade with quad cores. Something to think about as we move into the, uh, you know, next year, especially, I think. Yeah. 16 does seem like we're kind of stuck there, but honestly, I'm still waiting for the software folks to catch up to it. So <laughs> true, true. Uh, I, I do have a couple quick uh, uh, super chats I want to get to. Uh, Eek44 gave us 45 Danish Crone. Thank you. Uh, said, uh, damn, my size is too big, too many an angstrom and nanometer to use that metric. Uh, VC, <laughs> VC gesture that gave us $5. Thank you. Said, uh, uh, when will we need to measure circuits in plank, plank lengths? Uh, I had to ask what oh, that you is, mean I think you know what that is. <sighs> So, so, so that would mean Intel twenty A would actually be Intel two to the times ten to the twenty five planks. <laughs> yeah, I believe I saw on Twitter. <laughs> it's uh, we're gonna have to go a bit smaller first. Mm. Oh, okay, as in reduce the physical size of atoms. If you work that out, there's there's a billion in it for you. Uh, well, and then uh, Steel Skin six six seven uh, kind of follows this up says. Um, for for Ian, uh, are there any plans to standardize how silicon density is measured? Does Intel's new naming no. scheme mean that it is still far from becoming a reality? No, no standards. Uh, it's it's. It, there are so many things in this industry where they create a standards body, or they define a set of specifications, and it's up to the companies to sign up to it. Right, so things like PCIe, DDR, these are all you know standards that everybody adheres to, and CXL is going to become the new one. And but then we have you know things that are kind of standards, but not everybody agrees to, and that's like all the um, if you've heard of the OCP accelerator module for AI chips or uh, Nvidia's high-end GPUs, and that's all done by the Open Compute Project, and you know AMD isn't a member of that. So none of their stuff really goes into that sort of. So I, there's whether that whether something like transistor density could become a standard. I don't know. I think that there might be a, a few too many egos involved. Yeah, I, for that to happen. There's also there's no way because it is it is to every company's. Comp it's not even about egos. It's about it's called, it's, it's De Niro, right? It's because you can market. <laughs> yeah. They have, whether Intel's 10 nanometer parts are any good or not, I don't know, but I just, what I do know is when I see seven nanometer and I hear talk about five nanometer as a consumer, like, wow, it must be better. It means a meter. That's a yep. metric system, Ian. That's not like that stuff they use in America <laughs> to measure things, inch, foot. That makes no sense. This is the metric system. The entire world uses it. Scientists use it, except at NASA. But- it's a metric system, so it's real. So <laughs> five nanometers is better than seven nanometers. So also industry standards usually take about a decade to actually get anywhere. So not yet. I mean, uh, CXL was at Intel for about eight years before they actually made it a bit open, and now it's taken another two, three to 
jump off and we're still not going to get into products until you know a few years after I like to think of standards as how everybody agrees to screw things up. Like, this is the standard. We are all going to be a little different so they don't quite fit. Like, a nut that doesn't it's, quite it's, fit on that screw is like, that's... It's, it's what everybody agrees to, but nobody wants. Yeah. And then I, it's just really, yeah, industry standards are, yeah, it's, right, it's... And then it's, I... Well, I... Uh, I would love to know, like, if anybody could ever prove, like, because everybody sort of assumes that standards get screwed up because well, this doesn't favor me Let's go in there and screw it up or slow it down right so they get in their mm. committee i just has anybody ever proved that or is that just conspiracy theory craziness you know uh um is it that there, there, there's a law brooks law i think um i have it down here because uh yeah brooks law adding people to a project makes it later <laughs> yeah <laughs> i think that, i think that applies but 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 the thing is with with some standards you do get that one company that says no that's useless i'm going to go do my own thing and then eventually they meet and the new thing gets incorporated into the standard and or it you know or you know the new standard then becomes a superset which includes both uh so for example again i'll, I'll come back to cxl uh compute express link is actually based on the pcie physical protocol but also speaking to the cxl team they say any cxl product also has to support pcie so i know back when it was being announced we were talking about well will there be cxl only graphics cards for example and the answer to that is in the first two versions no because they'll fall back to pcie so the CS cxl standard relies on the pcie standard <laughs> for now at least but I mean, there's no, there's just no, it's not in AMD or or Intel's particular interest to sort of promote this really friendly open standard to let NVIDIA continue to bludgeon them though, right? It's not. Yeah. So it it feels like if I were AMD and Intel, I'm like, yeah, you know, we got our own thing. It's faster than PCIe. It's better, right? This is always yeah. like, well, yeah. it's better. That's why we're doing it. We're not going to use that, whatever. Yeah. That stuff is a mess, yeah. so. But in, Intel, Intel has the most installed GPUs of all three of them. So, yeah, <laughs> of the other two. Yeah, no. Well, it'll be interesting as, <laughs> as we get the, uh, Were there any more in here? Because I want to move on to packaging. Yeah, let, let, let's move on. Let's do it. So uh, obviously the node names. Although it sounds like you're saying, you know what? Let's let's give them, let's let's go with it, folks. This because I'm ever I'm sure the internet Twitter was angry lit up this morning saying this is baloney. You're losing. But you're saying, nah, you know, this mm. actually makes a lot of sense because. Nanometer doesn't it's, mean anything. I mean, yeah, like I say, I, I've been advocating it for a couple of years, and I know other people have, and I know a lot of people who are reading it for the first time are going, huh? Um, yeah, let let it settle in. I mean, you can you can you feel free to agree with me, disagree with me, uh, disagree with what Intel's doing, but let it sink in. Uh, knee jerk reactions. Yeah, I understand them, and I understand that I've been thinking about it for longer for a lot longer so totally understand but yeah let's give them let's give them one okay and let's see if they execute so the next thing i want to move on is they talked about a couple new technologies they like i mean it was really a tour de force of you know intel fabrication stuff uh, one was uh, accelerated power vias and accelerated uh, ribbon fets can you talk about what exactly those mean actually there's a video we can watch too right we're gonna we'll, we'll need the video but it'll just kind of show uh it kicks off i think it shows off the uh ribbon fets it shows off the uh accelerated power vias um is this awesome stuff are you impressed by this ian it's the the ribbon fets is it, it's what it's their marketing name for gate all around and uh, intel has actually been speaking about it in technical conferences for a while um we knew it was going to kind of incept at the old intel 5 so now that they're announcing it as uh, going to be here in a few years great it's uh, it's a really great technology that has lots of opportunities for development um power vias hasn't been talked about with as much vigor in those technical conferences but again it's one of those things that we've known that has been coming and uh that also has lots of potential in how we design future processes um because we, we're now getting to 
what power via solve the problem of where to put the power on the chip um which is going to become an issue as we want these smaller chips to draw more power especially so i'm definitely for these technologies i wish they were here sooner rather than later i think intel said um you know 2024 yeah in in the presentations which is fair enough stuff like this takes years to develop years to produce and then you have to find the right inception point i think they said they're actually going to be working to try and manufacture power via on uh you know uh older uh process nodes on you know 10 7 4 cool. before they actually implement it in products um just you know just to make sure it all works and that they can continually scale it down uh you know so i wish it was here already to a certain degree um i think one of the questions we're going to ask when they come along is explicitly what percentage benefit it gives for you know the various metrics of power performance area um manufacturing difficulty all these all, all these sorts of things that consumers never think about but from our perspective of wanting to understand how these things are made and what the roadmap is you know if, if you follow the financial markets that's always what they want to know yeah um, and, and for power via it is uh basically separating for people like me who need to understand it the the, the power typically sits on top of all, all the transistors and you you basically then you're dealing with i'm guessing a noise issue but power via backside you you're now feeding the power through the backside of the of the the uh board right the uh, the, the, the the way i like to explain it is a normal processor is like a cake it comes in layers. It's a layered cake. So at the bottom, you have the transistors. And then on top of that, you have, you know, connectivity wires. And then continually above that, you have more and more and more connectivity wires just because these chips are complex. You typically have 12 or 13 layers. And in that, you also have to feed the power because it's the transistors that need the power. What PowerVia does is it takes all of that power circuitry and puts it on the opposite side. So now you have a sandwich. Transistor filling, and instead of bread, you have communication on one side, power on the other. So that means that your um, your communication wires uh, don't have that interference with the power, like you said, because when you put high current through a wire, it's going to produce a field and cause signal integrity issues. You get rid of that, so you can either decrease the size of the wires, increase uh, you know, as a getting better area out of your design or you make your wires thicker, which means that they can handle higher frequency data transfer. So now you've also increased the performance of your processor. So there's the, that's the trade-off, performance versus uh, area. And there's gonna be some power things as well because you have fewer power losses. Um, the, the, one of the issues I think that, that this is I think I wrote in my article on an Antec on this, is that normally when we build uh, a processor, you start with the transistors because they're the smallest. They're the ones that are most difficult. So if you screw up at that stage, you can just chuck the wafer and start again. Because now the transistors are in the middle, you're making, it sounds like you're making one side of the chip first, whether that's the power or the communication wires. And with respect, they're actually easier than the transistors, but you still got to put in several layers before you get to the transistors. So then if you screw up doing the transistors, you've now lost, you know, say six layers of power delivery and you have to throw it all away. It's your exit strategy takes longer to execute if you screw up, but hopefully the end product is worth it. Hmm. Um, but yeah, uh, it's p p power via I think the performance aspect is going to be important for when we speak about leading edge, um, the area stuff. Uh, with, with these new process nodes, the first chips they do are usually the really tiny ones because that gets you your better yield. So usually mobile processors, if they can decrease mobile processors even further and get better yields, that may mean that it becomes easier to come to market with next generation laptop chips first. Hmm. And we all want companies like Intel to come out with their next gen processors quicker. So it helps with that. The, the one thing I didn't get an answer to is uh, the issue about thermals, right? So in a, in a processor, your transistors 
generate all the heat. They use all the energy. Now, in a, in a normal processor, even though you've made the transistors first, you flip the chip over. That's why it's called a flip chip. And your transistors are on the top. They can radiate the energy away into the bulk silicon and then into your heat sink and what have you. In a sandwich, you're going. Th you've got the power at the bottom. That's where your you know balls or your pins are. Then the transistors, and then you've got the heat energy to go through the communication wires. Now, does that help? Does that hinder? Does it hinder to a measurable degree? And I think that's the key point. I'm going to say that it probably doesn't hinder it, but it's still a question I want answered. Yeah. Um, but yeah, power, power, power via important for sure. Yeah, it would it would hopefully wouldn't make it worse, but it's sort of like when we went to twenty two nanometer and <laughs> the mm. die size got so tiny it was hard to actually get the heat out of the the uh, desktop part, yeah. right? So that's so it's uh, th thermal density. Uh, I think I think you remember the Pentium four graph that showcased thermal density versus a uh, rocket engine. <laughs> mm. <laughs> yeah, it's how how many watts per square per square centimeter can you get? And I think we're still an order of magnitude away from a rocket engine. Um, but we're getting close. And Pentium 4 got close, and it will only ever become more of an issue. Though that being said, moving to chiplets and tiles may mitigate a lot of that. Hmm. Uh, and then other, the one other thing I, I want to, as far as the packaging goes, can we talk about the ribbon fets? Because fin fets mm -hmm. we're familiar with. Um, this yeah. is you're wrapping the entire transistor with a gate now? Yeah. Yeah, so FinFET, um, FinFET was just one tall you know, pillar, essentially, and now we're cutting that pillar into several different slices, That uh, putting the gate around it. That helps bring your drive current up, which increases performance. You know, that's the short way of explaining that. Um, the, be the main benefit it does, aside from helping increase the drive current, is when you build your transistors. So normally your transistor, like I mentioned earlier, you can have you know 10 gates. I think in some transistor designs we're down to six gates, and there are other ways you can get around you know reducing it by another gate as well. Instead of that, imagine it only being one gate, but you can instead of it having a fixed width, you can now make it from any width from say 15 nanometer to 40 nanometer. What that does is means that you can tune your transistor to a very, very specific power, frequency, voltage window. Previously, in, in FinFET design, in order to tune, you had very discrete points on that voltage, frequency, power curve. Um, they're, they're called uh, you know, VTD devices or VT devices. You can either go for the ultra low power or you can go for the ultra high performance. And then you have like two or three options in between. Now that's just a continuous line. So that gives you more options when you design your processor to really optimize for your performance window. That being said, you and I both know that when companies like Intel and AMD produce CPU cores, they just do one design and it has to do everything from five watts to 120 watts. <laughs> so whether that really helps that sort of design point not sure, but if we're thinking about, say, AI chips like Google's TPU or maybe some of the other ones like Tens Torrent, they're usually optimized for one power window, and that's where I think it's going to help a lot. Hmm. Yeah. Um, Ribbon Fet is is their marketing name. Samsung's going to call theirs uh, MCB Fets. Um, or nano sheets. I don't think TSMC's officially made a name yet. I, I like. I it was a, a comment on one of your videos. It was like someone needs to really use Boba Fett because they're really that's <laughs> yes. a good Django Fett is another <laughs> Fett you could use. And then then there's cross promotion with Disney and you know all kinds of stuff. E e e cross promotion or cross legal action? Or cross legal action, I suppose. Because it's Disney. <laughs> But you know, hey, our chips got Boba Fett. You, that's that is going to be like, whoa! It's got Boba. No, Fett. it's 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 it, it's not Boba from Star Wars. It's Boba as in bubble tea. What you want about? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's what I thought too, actually. <laughs> and I guess we're we're not going to see it. I was just looking at the roadmap. We're not going to see ribbon fets in uh, immediately. This is we're, we're that's all the way in the angstrom era of twenty twenty four plus, right? 
they, they said 2024 for production, which probably means 2025 for product. That's that. That's one of the things about these announcements with the process nodes and the packaging and the new advancements. They're all talking about when the process is ready, not when products are coming to market. And usually we speak about the latter, but this is very much the former. Uh, uh, just clarification, Flash Photo says, sounds like Ian is suggesting this will be ideal for GPU chips in the data center? Yes. If I mean, um, I know some of them are very fixed power. Uh, it's just like NVIDIA does a 400 watt version of the A100. And I think they also do, a, was it four, five, and maybe even a 600 watt version? And if they can optimize the silicon for 600 watts and it makes sense for them financially, yeah. Yeah, then it works there. There are some, because you're doing it in a variable length, there are some issues with power rails and delivery and all that jazz, but uh, <laughs> that, that that requires a whole university lecture to go through. <laughs> you have any more uh, packaging questions? Because I, I, you know, as a, as a, as a mere consumer, I, I want to move on to the, what we think of the next generation parts. No, I will say uh, VC Jester gives $2 said Corvette. Uh, so like a Corvette, I don't know. I think, I think that's what they're oh, saying. Uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, no, let, let's, uh, let's move on. We, cause yeah, you it, know, some, it, somebody it, said this earlier, this is all great discussion, but, but how does this translate to the, the normal person? What, what does this mean for what's coming out? Yeah. Uh, you know? And uh, you just want to point out, so Alder Lake, which is still, I think it's still on the map for end of this year-ish, it will mm -hmm. be built on Intel 7. And uh, also yes. they did talk about Meteor Lake, which I think is built on Intel 4, 2023? Yeah, yeah. What, uh... What's your take on Alder Lake? You ha I know you have strong opinions. And what do you think about <laughs> Meteor Lake? Because they did show off, um, you know, a, an illustration of what it might look like. Yeah, it was so old Lake being Intel's first hybrid CPU. I, I actually got an email saying, uh, are they going to announce it on October the 27th, which is Intel's innovation event? Because Pat Gelsinger said it would be a hybrid event. What he means is people will be in person and virtual, <laughs> not hybrid processors. <laughs> but, um, Intel bringing this sort of hybrid strategy of high performance and high efficiency cores to the desktop, to me, doesn't make sense because it's not a power limited environment in that way. Um, when you have these hybrid uh, developments, one of the issues is that both sets of cores usually have to have the same instruction sets. And we know that Intel's big cores will have, say, AVX512, but the little cores don't, which means that if you ever have the little cores active, AVX512 won't be active. So there's that to consider. Um, I think we've seen suggestions that there will be retail units without the little cores enabled anyway. So that's going to that's gonna make everything more confusing. Well, more confusing, I guess, if you use AVX512. Um, can argue how many people actually use that. Uh, but one of the issues I had, which I think is, it might, uh, I've mellowed on this idea that when you have these sort of hybrid CPU designs, one of the issues is the uh, operating system has to be able to know which cores to schedule um, your software on. And the whole idea of using hybrid CPUs in mobile was, well, they can run background tasks, but you still have to understand, well, what is a background task? And Android, the scheduler was developed with that in mind, right? So it can identify when you're you know, downloading your email in the background or getting notifications versus playing a game. At the time when Alder Lake was kind of announced, we knew Windows 10, and we'd already seen Windows 10 on some hybrid designs like Lakefield, like uh, Qualcomm Windows on Snapdragon. And it didn't really work that well because Windows from the ground up was built to be a homogeneous CPU architecture platform, as in all CPU cores were the same. Now Windows 11 is coming along and it kind of feels like they're building the scheduler to be hybrid CPU aware. 
which is good. Uh, we'll see. Proof will be in the pudding, so to speak. So one of the arguments for having these little cores on the desktop will be, well, hang on, if you do have an, a multi-core workload, say a video render, you can do it on the big cores at the same time as the little cores, and you can fit four little cores in the space of a big core. Won't that help with performance? And I'll say yes in that workload. But you and I, Gordon, reviewing CPUs, how many times do people complain when we do an all CPU workload? <laughs> yeah, people don't find it representative. Well, so I, it depends on who's who's complaining. I will tell you, AMD yeah. never complains. AMD's like, oh, hey, have you checked out this new one? This is really cool. This yep. this is a this is a new rendering metric. Oh, that's that's really neat. But yeah, no, yeah. I, and I, I hear you there. I that's why I I've never really understood big little on desktop or frankly in anything larger than an ultrabook like a gaming laptop it's like i don't understand yeah. it but but i can also sort of see like intel saying you know what we're we are tired of using this nanometer thing against us we invented that and and then the other thing i i can sort of see them because like, well, you know what we've been saying we don't you know you really no one is doing cinebench no one plays cinebench the game <laughs> but you know what? We're tired of it. We're going to make a part that it just rocks everybody's world in Cinebench, right? I, I could see them sort of saying like, you Ooh. know what? Let's just, we got a bigger Cinebench number than you. And that's, that's really, that is a lot of the, and outside, you know, cause outside, of, there's not a lot of nuance with all reviews of CPUs, right? And, and I think, mm. You know, it is hard to argue that really high, you know, one to four threads is more valuable than 16 threads to a lot of people because somebody needs it. But I, if I were Intel, like, you know, I don't care. Just give me bigger Cinebench because that's all the media cares about. So we're going to do it. So I, I, I can see that happening. I mean, is yeah, that too uh, cynical or I mean? Well, the, the, the problem is Intel can't keep flip flopping on whether benchmarks matter or not. Yes, they can. <laughs> They, well, I mean, they can, but it, the optics of it doesn't look good. Yeah, I sometimes it, wonder it, if it, they it, care anymore, though. You know, because there's <laughs> like, like I mean, perfect example is is nanometer, right? Because uh, seven is way smaller than fourteen. <laughs> Ten is smaller than fourteen, and you know, at a certain point, you just kind of you got to give up, you know. So with Intel and the whole benchmarks thing, I think um, if they'd come out and said. You know, real-world performance matters. Synthetic performance matters for those who need it, sure. But real-world performance also matters. The thing is, they didn't say the thing about the synthetic benchmarks. They kind of said, don't use those. And if they now turn around and say, well, actually, yes, you can use them again, that's where the optics of the messaging... If they had come out and said, it all matters, but we're going to focus on this bit, that's a different message from, you should only focus on this bit. And if they change that into, well, now these matter again because we get good scores. Um, that that being said, uh, I mean, some of the scores that have come out on, on Geekbench, I will point out that uh, Intel had a recent uptick on Geekbench because they increased their AES encryption score through having, um, you know, AVX512 accelerated instructions, I think. Or uh, they manipulated the way the AES instructions were run. So that score went up by 2x between uh, chips that don't have AVX 512 and those that do. So Geekbench needs an update. And I think uh, our, our friend Mr. Poole over at the uh, Geek Labs knows that as well. I think he's been working on it for over a year. I always take those numbers with a grain of salt. As in, I uh, no, actually, I, 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 I look at them and I go, I don't care. Show me them numbers i i think i'm in a privileged position though because both you and i will see real numbers before anybody else does and real numbers that we are confident are accurate yeah um, but i also understand the power of twitter twitter benchmarks you know and and 240 characters per second two yeah it's just really it comes down to oh my god look at my one score in this one benchmark on this one you know, platform mm -hmm. and like, oh, it's it's over, it's over. Everybody go home. This is this is the best thing ever, and <laughs> and we know it's not true. And I I just and but I've been be beating my head against it ever since it feels like December, and 
I mean, forever. It, and I just, I just, at a certain point, you're just like, I don't, I don't care. We're going to lose the animator. We're going to give you like, hey, you want to run center bench? We tell you not to run it. Go ahead and run it all day. Look, it's bigger. It's better. You know, you know what do you say? Can the media then sort of turn around and say, oh, well, you know, actually, you're right. We only care about, you know, performance of those big cores. I, I don't know if that's going to happen, knowing what it's, what it's, it feels like a lot of reviews have turned into over the last, you know, 10 years. You know, it's not, this is not 10 years ago. It's, it's very different now. It's, so. You, you mean reviews have been optimized for the audience that reads them? Yeah. The question is, mm -hmm. are, are the reviews actually saying anything that affects the wider scope of, I mean, that's so that I think that's a bigger discussion between you, <laughs> you and I, and a few others <laughs> about the nature of benchmarking and reviews in its own right. To be honest, I think Alder Lake, one of the biggest issues will be around DDR4 and DDR5. Um, it's been reported that it will support both, though you won't be able to run both at the same time. It'll be one or the other. And it'll be up to the motherboard manufacturers to decide whether their boards support four or five. One of the issues is that there won't be a good amount of DDR5 in the market until next year. People are even saying middle of next year. We've already seen, I think, Team Group sold 10 kits of, on Newegg. Oh, well, that's a lot. <laughs> We're ready. You know, so, so, so it exists, but the people who bought it can't test it because they don't have a DDR5 enabled system. I, when, when Skylake came out, Skylake was a DDR4 platform, but the chip I was supporting supported DDR3. And there were some industrial motherboards that were both DDR3 and DDR4. You can only use the slots for one or the other. But for the wider market, it was all DDR4. And nobody had any issues about any of those motherboard generations supporting one or the other. And I think that's going to be a major issue for Old Lake if it comes out this year, which they say it will, and DDR5 isn't ready in the market, Does regardless that... of the price of DDR5 or what have you. Does yeah. uh does that mean support uh if they wanna uh if motherboard makers wanna include support for both, I can imagine the cost of manufacturing the motherboard is gonna go up, right? So I've heard that Intel will not allow those companies to manufacture boards with both, only one or the other. And oh. the way that they are likely going to enforce that will be based on chipset version. Ooh. Hmm. Okay. So, so, so you might have say a 670 being DDR4, but a 770 being DDR5, and we might only actually get DDR5 boards when Alder Lake gets updated based on the time frame, or, or there may be some special Alder Lake DDR5 only boards early for you know people like you or me to review it as an early. I, I, I can because there are some DDR5 kits in the market. I can fully say. I can fully assume that Intel will say to people like Gordon and I, here's your board, here's your CPU, and here's some DDR5 memory. Test it on DDR4, or here's a DDR4 board as well. Test it on DDR4, test it on DDR5, showcase the difference, but understand that end users may not get the latter until Q1 or Q2 next year. Hmm. That's what they will do. We'll, we'll be able to test DDR5 before most people, I think, in that regard. Yeah. Um, because that would be something that Intel would want to promote and promote heavily. Yeah, no, I... I, I the gluttons that we are, we all do it as well. Although I can almost see them just saying, you know what, let's just, let's go all the way to, to 10. Just do DDR5, you know, and, you know, this is the best. It, it'll still make them look stronger. And then hopefully you don't point out that mm. you can't get DDR5 you know as end users but hey shoot for the moon right that that feels like that's kind of been done well, no, before in the past you know the the problem is without any memory you can't run the system in the past where it's been like well you can kind of build a system but you can't buy a discrete gpu but your chip has an integrated one you can still use that until you buy it when it's ddr5 you can't yeah you know? but i i sort of feel like the way modern the way the modern marketing is done now is show off the very best case scenario to talk about it. Yeah. Cause now you have a halo look, everybody halo else, effect. when you go buy your OEM system, you buy your, you know, your big box PC, it's going to run DDR4 cause there's no way there's going to be enough 
DR5. Yeah. In in out there and and at that's affordable. So although I why would you yeah. why would why would they intensely limit dual dual functionality boards? Is it they just think it's um I I I would believe it'd be a case of trying to do all the traces. So DDR5 has a lot stricter requirements when it comes to memory tracing um, because we're uh, moving to a higher number of transfers per second. Yes, the latency is is going to be yeah. slower, <laughs> bigger, but slower. Yeah, we know what we mean. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the, what, what, one of the issues with those combo DDR3 and DDR4 boards was that you could have dual channel, two per channel DDR3 but only one per channel DDR4 on the same board. So you had six slots, not eight. Um, so, and then also it's a question of, do you have to use some of the same pins for the one controller and the other, and then making sure the CPU detects the right ones and the fallback in case somebody puts both types in and making sure it doesn't short it out. I don't think the voltages will be any issue, but there might be some signaling problems. There's probably a lot of technical reasons in there. I don't think it's just a case of, well, we don't want to. Okay. Um, but it does it does simplify things a lot easier. That being said, you can fully expect that there will be some custom boards on the market with both. Um, that's how I got the combo Skylake DDR3, DDR4 board before anybody else. Yeah, and I think you just it, have to ask the right people. And it's also it's a really good marketing message for motherboard maker to say, "Hey, DDR5 is super expensive, but we made this board. You can buy our start with DDR4 mm -hmm. next year when DDR5 is cheaper. Throw out the DDR4, populate the DDR5, and you know you're good to go." That's yeah. no one ever does it, but that mm -hmm. is always like your super strong marketing message they have done it's, from every every memory transition except for RAM bus, right? It, you get those weird well, duck motherboards. Well, uh, well, I mean, one of the arguments is that usually first gen of a new DDR isn't as great as the best of the previous. When you're comparing JDEC to JDEC specs, uh, as in specifically what the CPU supports, then yes, it usually is an uplift. But if you're comparing the best DDR4 to the entry level DDR5, then yeah, the best DDR4 probably will be better performance, strictly on a performance. Right level so it's a lot of the ddr5 that's currently being ma manufactured is being saved for servers because hey what why sell a kit to somebody like you or i for 300 dollars when you can sell it for a thousand to a server vendor and because they'll be ramping up with um sapphire rapids in mind and uh well uh depending on when is it genoa next gen epic is coming out it, yeah, we're expecting that to be DDR5 as well. So, yeah, saving the silicon for that, I think. And then what comes out on the market for for the regular public will be the worst bind of the lot. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I just, having gone through so many memory transitions, I just know that people always get jazzed for one bigger number DDR or, you know, and I, there's always that like everybody oh, likes bigger numbers unless they're nanometers yeah unless you're banana meters. <laughs> but the, people always got i gotta have ddr4 you know and i i fall into, into that trap myself where I, I i i want the next thing and it's it's generally it's just better to go for ddr4 but then when they dial up their reviews of it and like whoa look alder like screams at ddr5 they're gonna go i want ddr5 if alder lake is better with yep. and you know i i that's a that's a tough one. Uh, also, uh, I, 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 no, go ahead. Sorry, uh, I was going to say from a consumer perspective, the best thing to do is know where your bottleneck is for mm -hmm. what you do, mm -hmm. whether it's a storage, whether it's CPU, memory, GPU, core count. Mm -hmm. Profile your profile what you do, whether it's personal, professional. It's like when I, I the, my video editor that I use to make uh, videos for the channel. I know my limit is my single core performance. You know, as it's I can stick a better GPU in there, I can stick faster. I've even moved to a RAM disk for my cached video files. And that hasn't increased the speed because my speed is my single core performance. No no way your bottleneck is. And if your bottleneck is memory, it's rare that it, it you it's rare that it is. 
unless you're running an APU, but yeah, hmm. no uh, worries. Also, James Pryor in the chat uh, uh, wanted to uh, point out that uh, any any combo DDR4, DDR5 boards will negate any uh, cost saving of going DDR4 at first. So if, if you buy the combo saying, hey, you know what, I'm going to save some, go DDR, DDR4 and then upgrade, probably the price of a combo motherboard is going to negate that. <laughs> no, that is a really good point. But, you know, and sometimes, and we fall into the trap with the upgrade option on motherboards too. It's like, yeah, we have DDR5 slots on there, but those things don't work for hell. I mean, they're just terrible. Yeah. And we just kind of threw them on there because we knew you would never populate that slot. It's like a 10% chance. And you did. Your performance sucks. But you got DDR5. And that that mm -hmm. is, yeah, it's better just... Alder Lake with DDR4 probably makes a lot of sense, but uh, p people are going to be like, I got to have DDR5 because that's where the performance is. And I mean, uh, to, to, to respond to James, uh, chances are that if you're going to be an early adopter on this, um, cost isn't necessarily going to be your biggest concern. <laughs> yeah. You, you, you're paying the early adopter tax anyway. Very true. Uh, I do want to go back to to a question I it scrolled by a while ago, so I'm sorry I didn't mark it. Uh, but somebody was saying the back to the big little design. Does that mean Windows 11 uh, is is or I should say Windows 10 isn't really going to have support for understanding the big little design, where Windows 11 the performance is is going to be way better? Well, I mean, so Windows 10 already knows about hybrid cpu designs sorry i refuse to say big little because oh, that's yep, that's sorry. technically an arm marketing term uh you can say it i just won't <laughs> uh so they, it does know about hybrid cpus because we've already had lakefield on windows we've already had uh windows on the snapdragon so it will exist it will work we, ex or we expect it to work whether it'll work the best it can possibly do i'm under the impression that you will need windows 11 for that and Gordon and I both know that the minute Intel sends their reviewer's guide, when we get these chips, they will say, here's what you'd get on Windows 10. Here's what you should expect to see on Windows 11. We recommend Windows 11. And we recommend that you recommend Windows 11 as well. Yeah. So, oh, man, I didn't even think about that, too. Yeah, you, you'll have another wrinkle in it because Windows 11 is so close. <laughs> so you know, you'll, you'll have uh, multiple RAM <laughs> generations and Windows 10, Windows 11. That's, that's a lot of testing. Yeah, I, I also see, like, if you're going next generation parts, there's no reason not to go for the latest operating system anyway. But, it, it, mm. you know, no. Oh, wait. Okay. I, Ian's going to disagree. I, uh, <laughs> I disagree. Um one of the things that I want whenever I do an upgrade is um, stability. And if a new OS isn't stable and I've got workloads that can benefit, if I've got a workflow that can benefit from the new hardware, I'm going to stick with my stable workflow until the unstable stuff gets sorted. So, yeah, there is one thing to say about being on the leading edge, but it's the same reason I no longer overclock my systems. It's because I need to work and I haven't updated my system in four plus years now. Whereas back four years ago, I would probably would have done it on a weekly basis. Mm -hmm. When I started reviewing hardware, because it was all very new, any, any hardware that I got the rare chance to store for persistent use, you know, I mothballed it into some of my systems and that was a regular basis. Nowadays, just give me something that works. Yeah, automatic transmission is is awesome. I can tell you, it's really fun <laughs> to have those manual transmissions. Like, ah, uh, not anymore. But I, yeah, I mean, yeah, Windows. I, yeah, that's the worst thing, right? Because I, you have you have finite amount of time. You're gonna have mm -hmm. to retest everything anyway, sort of, if everything's mm -hmm. new. So, I, I'm like, if I have to choose between Windows and 10 and Windows 11 for future parts, I'm it's going to suck, but it'll have to be Windows 11. But, well, but it, by that point, when I'll, I, I guess I don't know exactly when Alder Lake's gonna, supposed to come out, but uh, the, that doesn't mean Windows 11 will officially be out either, though, right? You're still kind of in the preview phase. Yeah, no, that's a good point, yeah. Because we're not... Windows 11, they've pushed into next year now, right? And Alder Lake is still this year? So I guess... It's... I, I think they said automatic updates to Windows 11 would roll out next year but the actual launch of the os is this year oh <clears throat> okay I, I may i may be wrong about that that's 
I'm I'm not necessarily paying much attention to it in the first place anyway. <laughs> Oh well, it's cause, cause, because yeah, we we have to retest everything if we're gonna, from a testing perspective, switch over. Because mm. uh, I don't, we're not going to be able to keep the data that we've accrued over the last few years. Uh, I I think I know the answer to this, but Corbin uh, would like to uh, put in the chat. Uh, so, is this release of Windows eleven? Uh, uh, is the release of Windows eleven so close to Alder Lake just a coincidence? I don't think so. Mm. I mean, I, if they really do benefit from it, I, I really feel, and that's the worst thing because, you know, there's few things in this, in this world that Intel's afraid of. And Microsoft is one of those things that they sort of have to, they're kind of tied to the hip with some of these launches for their OS. So they're mm. sort of, and you know, Microsoft wants to show off Windows 11 really well. So that could really screw the launch up too. You have to think about, how long has Windows 11 been in development versus how long has Alder Lake been in development? If Intel hadn't had all those issues with its 10 nanometer, would Alder Lake have been released actually two years ago? And when Intel knew that they were designing for Alder Lake, did they turn around to Microsoft and say, hey, we've got this coming up, you need to sort some stuff out? And then magically the timelines have kind of come together it's yeah but then, but then again i say microsoft has been kind of working on hybrid cpu schedulers for a little while the thing is this is the first os that's going to be from the ground up aware and hopefully do it better do you think they could have just lines lucky couldn't they have just i mean because at one point you know windows 10 would be the last os ever couldn't they have just simply, you know, updated the scheduler in 10, you know, but is it, I mean, it's, you can't it, upgrade in places, I would imagine not fun, but could they have done I th that? I, I, I think it's fundamental enough that you have to change some things at such a low level that a, uh, a fresh rewrite, it's probably not a fresh rewrite. They're probably, you know, migrating 80% of the code over as well whatever because a lot of stuff already still still works really well but yeah it's it's a, it, when when microsoft said windows 10 would be the last windows ever they didn't see this on the horizon <laughs> <clears throat> it's funny though i i never could get because i always thought we were gonna have so many big changes you know intel always had this sort of dream of you know uh, obtain you know persistent memory for consumers where you could mm -hmm. potentially have, you know, two terabytes. Like, well, how in the world do you make... You're not going to just and, simply and install or just move your Windows 10 over to that. I mean, it feels mm -hmm. like it was such a massive change. You'd have to do something big, but... And now they don't even have a facility that manufactures it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the last question I have for for this future CPU stuff before we move on is how, how does this relate to uh, or specifically Alder Lake coming out, how does that relate to the stuff that AMD has going on on their side, the 3D vCache and, and all that stuff? If you mean by relate, how does it affect? Uh, no, well, it doesn't uh, affect. Sorry, I, I don't mean affect. It, uh, I mean like, you know. What, for, for what, Veros versus vCache. Yeah. I think it's probably a fair way to say it because, hey, AMD's got their stack in it. Can you explain the differences between AMD's approach with the vCache and what Intel yeah. is doing with next generation of Foveros and Foveros yeah, Plus Plus so, Plus? So a AMD vCache is using one of TSMC's packaging technologies uh, called chip-on wafer. It's uh, SOIC chip-on wafer. And uh, TSMC has kind of been showing it off in, in the various technical conferences for a little while now. Um, and it's all to do with literally, well, the simple way is they're both putting chips on chips, but the way they're doing it is different. So chip-on wafer, you basically, you're having copper interconnects essentially directly attached. So you've got to have two very flat surfaces, put it in, and then seal it. And then the the distance between all the connections, the idea, the goal is to be as uh, as low as 10 microns. That's the goal. Now, with, with, with Foveros, what you're doing is a bit different. 
you're still doing those connections, but you're not directly bond. You're not directly putting one chip on top of each another. You're on both chips. You're putting small copper pillars and then small tin solder balls, and then kind of sandwiching them together and then filling in the gap in the middle. That's what creates your connection. The reason they're doing that is because it's easier and better yielding. And that's just the way the research has gone down that route. It's been at research at Intel for, you know, 10 plus years. So, but the downside is with Foveros, at least in the first gen and the second gen, um, when uh, Meteor Lake's going to be using the second gen, is that these pillars have to transmit both data and power. Um, and uh, as we discussed before with the power via stuff, if you, you start moving power around, you get interference and signal integrity and stuff to manage. And if you're able to take out the power, then you can um, make the data connections really, really small, really, really close together. You get density in increases. Um, you also get bandwidth increases. Now, the goal with the vCache um, on AMD, as I understand it, is that there's enough power in the data lines to keep the cache going. Uh, as, and also cache doesn't need that much power. Whereas with Foveros, your top chip is your compute chip, and then your bottom chip is your IO die. That's how Lakefield was. With vCache, it's the other way around. You've got your you've got essentially a low power cache at the top and your compute die at the bottom. AMD's got around it by making sure that the cores don't actually have anything above them. It's just cache on cache, which is a too high stack of vCache. TSMC has demonstrated a 12 i stack <laughs> of silicon. Now, the silicon didn't have anything in it, but they just say, we can bond 12 pieces of silicon together without issue at reasonable yields. So AMD could, if they wanted, keep stacking cache until they get to a point where thermals get out of the way. But with Foveros, um, Intel does have an equivalent to the vCache design coming. Uh, they're calling it Foveros Direct, which is chip on wafer in a similar similar sort of style. They've earmarked 2023 for that. Uh, I believe they're calling it fourth generation Foveros, but it could be used with regular Foveros and could be used with other types of Foveros as well. Um, but we will we would have to wait until 2024 for a product. So in that respect, TSMC is three years ahead of Intel manufacturing, and it's already being productized inside AMD. Um, end of this year, beginning of next, we'll see. Um, interesting technology, for sure. Um, requires a lot more research and development than just a simple planar chip. Uh, but I think those days are, are almost gone now. And, of course, we won't know what's better until we get the the end product in so that's for a consumer that's the only thing that seems to matter is what's what's better in the end so yeah the um you remember when we when we had broadwell cpus from intel with the extra uh, ed ram that kind of acted like a cache before main memory the main workloads that benefited from that integrated graphics gaming compression and some encryption that's it so with AMD having an extra 64 megabytes of, uh, or having much cash extra per chiplet, that's the sort of workloads it's going to improve. And that's what AMD said, right? An average of 15% in gaming. For regular workloads, I'm not sure it will produce the same effect. It may only be a couple of percent. So are we getting a true generational jump with Zen 3 plus vCache versus regular Zen 3? For gaming, yeah, for everything else, I'm I'm not so convinced based on what I've previously tested. Hmm. Uh, what about applied to APUs though? Because that definitely seems like it yeah, could yeah, aid yeah, them. Yeah. But, yeah, I mean, I guess that's yeah, a given. It's, uh, I mean, I mean, uh, the the idea is to work out um, an individual core when it's pulling stuff from main memory. What level cache is it in, or what where it is in main memory, and how much of those are beyond the standard 32 or 16 megabytes of uh, cache that it has access to in that sort of uh, linear visual space? And if it can fit more into the cache, then that's great. It will speed up those accesses. But 
only if those accesses are the bottleneck will it improve performance. And for most CPU workloads, those accesses are not the bottleneck. But for yeah, for gaming, for APUs, it will be. Um, so look forward to it. Though when Vcash comes to APUs, uh, ask again this time next year, maybe. Yeah, it doesn't seem like it's really a, a low cost kind of a technology there. So or maybe in mobile, also, though, I suppose. It's it's also taking up seven nanometer capacity, and we don't know what the associated yield is when you have an extra. You know, so the yield for putting that chip on chip might only be 95 percent so does that mean prices are going to go up five percent and you're paying extra for the silicon is that worth it for the workload you're running lots of different factors here some of which amd may talk about most of which amd won't hmm. but we'll ask anyway won't we yeah <laughs> <laughs> i i i actually want to ask because we're talking about tsmc the the crazy world because i mean Intel was talking about, hey, you know, we got our fab services. We'll we'll work for anybody. Um, although you pointed out earlier before the show that Qualcomm hasn't signed on, but Intel says, hey, Qualcomm might be a partner or might be a customer. And I just was just thinking of the crazy world where Intel fabs are making Qualcomm SOCs that Microsoft is trying to use to basically push x86 and intel overboard with in a way and at the same time intel is contracting with tsmc and you sort of mentioned this crazy thought like well what's to stop yeah. amd from hiring intel you know i mean that's just like well yeah it's uh, i think i i mentioned you know the samsung conundrum right so you have samsung foundry and you have samsung smartphone samsung foundry makes chips for qualcomm which compete directly with Samsung smartphones chips. So the best way to think about it is actually the, the Samsung model, right? Samsung Foundry is a different business unit to Samsung smartphone and uh, LSI and all the different divisions they have. So the goal for the unit is to have the best balance sheet, you know, profit shareholders, what have you, at the end of the day, regardless of who they're selling to. So if they just happen to knock out one of the other divisions because they've got a customer on that side, then that's business. Intel, I think one of the things that Intel hasn't decided to discuss yet is how exactly their foundry services are going to work organizationally. Is it going to be its own unique business unit or, or is it going to be integrated in some way with the product development so, I mean, so Intel has Foundry, Intel has uh, research and development in Foundry. They have research and development in product, and then they have product, right? Or product development. So where exactly the delineation between those groups are and how much synergy between the groups there are. I mean, so Samsung Foundry does work closely with when they're designing the chipsets so the the what the chipset team will be the first to have you know the latest process nodes design development kits and you know because it's a special relationship because it's technically an internal external internal sort of thing so maybe intel will get that may or or maybe intel will have a closer arrangement i think it only works if they have intel foundry only works if they make it its own business unit separate and then works out synergistic agreements you know d properly defined synergistic agreements as if intel uh, product was a customer because right now it's all one and the same that's the only way intel foundry works hmm. and then yeah the cross up with you know where they get their chips made where the competitors get their chips made with intel you know, or whether they both get their chips made somewhere else. And yeah, then that all works out. That's just the results of doing business as if they was, were all different companies anyway. So I just, it's weird to think like you get <laughs> the, the CPU business side gets kind of like 
gets put on its back because of the great work that the foundry division is doing for its competitors is just it, it's very strange but for, from my perspective it's fun to understand what's going on it's fun to understand how people inside each of these companies think but then also they might they might try and lead you up a stray path up the wrong path by telling you something else and so you have to work out whether what they're telling you is right I, this is why I'm a journalist, right? This is why I like analyzing this stuff. This is why I like talking to these people. Yeah, it doesn't matter for the end products at the end of the day, but it gets me up in the morning. <laughs> yeah, no, and, and I think people don't understand when you have a company, there's there's different, there's different masters that get served. There's different fiefdoms. And I remember being at, oh God, Lord, it was the launch of Westmere. And I asked, I was asking somebody from Intel, I was like, oh, so you're going to continue to do big socket, little socket? Does that make sense? Kind of like, because, you know, AMD, ain't no one buying AMD products right now. Why bother to do both? He goes, oh, yeah, yeah. we're going to get rid of that. We're going to we're going to stop doing the big socket because it's just like it doesn't make any sense. Right. And then I talked to somebody else at Intel. He's like, hell no, we're not going to stop doing that. It's like <laughs> they they definitely had very different views of of where the future of the company was, but it was always but, sort of like, like, whoa, don't you work for the same company? What? But you know, it's, it's in, not like internal that. debates. It's, it's when internal debates turn into internal politics. That's when as a member of the press, if you see it descend into politics, you start getting a bit wary. If it's healthy debate, then that's fair enough. Yeah. Politics is where it gets a bit grimy. Yeah. I mean, you know, it just kind of ends up, as long as the consumer ends up winning in the end, but I'm, you never know what, what feeds it, you know, the whole Ram bus versus, you know, DDR kind of fight that was yeah. a long time ago and all those different things. So. Yeah. I think it was before the show, you know, we were talking about how companies don't care about people, but the individuals inside the companies individually do, or at least some of them do, because we have to talk to them. Um, but as a corporate machine, um, you are just another big bag with a dollar sign on it yeah I mean, and that's people I, I mean part of the part of what's awesome of marketing is to make you think that they are making it just for you they care about just you <laughs> they're making it in rose gold just for you but it really it doesn't matter you're just it's all in the service of the shareholders folks that's what they care about <laughs> luckily both you being happy to pay a lot of money for a rose gold laptop lines up with the shareholders making a ton of money so they're all happy but sometimes when they decide like you know what we're not making rose gold anymore makes more money okay you'll be unhappy but so they the, won't make rose gold the funny thing there is with the product design team if they're doing something like that none of the people in the product design team when they're designing it are thinking about the shareholders but the manager of the team who has to attend the meeting with the other product managers gets told about the shareholders so it's it's like subconscious filters down and yeah yeah fun no. times <laughs> uh speaking of fun times we should get to some uh, some q a before we oh definitely we yes. get out of here we have um, had ian on for a long time let's do q a yeah uh the first one <clears throat> over at discord if you want to get your questions in there's a link to discord in, in the chat or just at me here uh live uh the first one that i'm going to read it today is from uh, david uh, it says, I'm curious about Dr. Potato's take on the Windows 11 hardware requirements and the security situation. Security is good. Defining security is hard. I am... So, so on, on a purely selfish level, I enjoy the fact that there are these limitations because it means I don't have to regression test Sandy Bridge. <laughs> <laughs> for the future people where, where people are going to ask should i upgrade from my 2600k and yeah when you're talking about windows 11 that no longer becomes a question <laughs> so on that level um it's good i think microsoft should stick to their guns yeah it's sad that say first generation zen don't doesn't fall under and that you know there are some there are some limitations that are going to catch some people out but we have to move the industry forward. We can't keep x86 is the way it is. And people say it's a bloated instruction set architecture because it supports so much legacy. 
Apple gets around it by dropping the legacy quickly and often. Now, those are the two extremes. Microsoft is doing something in the middle, which is which I think kind of works. At some point, we do have to drop the legacy. Whether you agree that's the three-year hardware or it should have been a five-year hardware limit, you've got to draw the line somewhere. And somebody has drawn that line. For anybody buying a new system, it shouldn't matter. For somebody who has to pick at every component and upgrade slowly, yeah, it's going to become an issue, but Microsoft has deemed you in the minority. So the, the fact that we now have um, software-based uh, TPMs um, solves it for most people, solves it for pretty much everything. Uh, that that I think the thing to look for, which hasn't really been mentioned, I think I've said it a couple of times, is uh, Microsoft Pluton, this new integrated hardware feature that's coming to Intel, AMD, and Qualcomm CPUs, basically anything that runs Windows. Um, I'm pretty sure that because Pluton is a requirement and TPM is like a set, a subset or a superset of Pluton moving forward, Pluton's not ready yet. I think Pluton came late in the day of um, design. So at some point, they're going to say you need a Pluton-enabled processor for Windows 11.1 or whatever. Uh, but TPM is the start to get people thinking about that, and I think that's a good idea. Okay, cool. Uh, we've got one from uh, Dark Helmet asks, why is it commonly said that in desktop you're not in a power-limited environment when many OEMs mm. cheap out on coolers uh, and customers don't get the full performance capability of the processor because of the power requirements? So I think you're, you're thinking about it from the max power. I'm thinking about it from the idle power. Everything about mobile is driven to keep your processor as low power as possible when you don't need it. In a desktop, it doesn't matter if when you don't need the processor, it's running at 5 watts or 20 watts. If your peak is 90 or peak is 110 or 280, the difference between 5 and 25 when you're idle means nothing. Small form factor you know, PCs and HTPCs aside. But in, in, in a socketed desktop, that when I say it doesn't matter in that regard, that's when I that's what I mean when it doesn't matter. Because you're not having to save every joule for your battery. Now you could argue about perform uh, efficiency and power saving and um all that green climate jazz, which is very important, but on the scale of five to twenty five watts idle, yeah, it it doesn't. I, I mean it doesn't for the product, does for the world, but that's a different discussion. Yeah, you don't. You basically don't. It doesn't just stop working because your idle is is twenty watts. For twenty watt idle on a mobile part is is death, right? That's just not gonna not gonna happen. Your ultrabook, your your nine watt ultrabook idles at twenty watts. Yeah. No. <laughs> uh, so I've I've a couple of fun questions to to finish out the 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 first one is a Prism Core. Uh, he asked uh, about what what kind of tech tech potato would make the best chip buddy. B U T T Y, uh, yep. so I'm I'm confused here because I th I thought I thought chips uh, as in the UK were called crisps. So why is it not crisp, buddy? I'm I'm assuming they're talking about peanut butter, right? Is that uh, no no <laughs> no? Oh. Okay. The, oh, okay, so so this is convoluted. So, um, what you call chips, we call crisps. Yep. But our chips are big fries, essentially, chunk chunk chunky chips. Uh, you know, like fish and chips. So when he says chip butty, butty is a colloquialism for a sandwich. Oh god. So a chip butty is just a chip sandwich. Wait. Or or you well, know, or a, 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 when you say chip sandwich you mean a french fry sandwich, which I I'm, I'm not against. I'll, I'll put yes. french fries on some sandwiches, but you're saying just french fries and some bread. Yeah, and yeah, whatever sauces you like, tomato, mayo. Not ranch. That's stupid. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, another thing. Another thing we don't have in the UK. Ranch. Uh, you can buy it, but nobody nobody buys it because it's terrible. Okay. Well, uh, then what, wait. Yes, what, what uh, is peanut butter then? Because peanuts are. I, I don't know what. So, so, <laughs> so peanut butter is the same as what you guys have. Oh, okay. Okay. Oh, wait. Wait. So the, uh, wait. The the, the butt 
the butty is, a is goes in a sandwich. A sandwich. Wait, I no, mean the butty is the sandwich. There's not. So you're talking about a potato on the sandwich, or no? It's simply. You mean it, a sandwich is in, called? But you, yeah. I, I, I don't want to. You folks invented the sandwich, Earl of Sandwich. You don't call it the sandwich right. there. No, we do call it the sandwich. It's just a colloquialism. Oh, okay. So, 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 when you go to a fish and chip shop, you can get your fish and chips and you know your saveloys and your sausages and. But they might also do like a a, a sausage butty or a chip butty. <laughs> butty, I've never. Yeah. You, okay. <laughs> it's, it's it's also because a, a a chip a potato sandwich sounds terrible, oh, but you call it a butty, yeah. and then you know I I refer back to when I was three year olds where literally my brother was drawing pictures of butts with chips in them. Yeah. Okay. Oh yes. <laughs> You'll like okay, that. Okay. Now I got that idea. In my head, <laughs> but, but no, but no, but the idea is that if you wanted something, the cheapest thing you can get at a fish and chip shop is the chips. Is 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 the fries? Got it. And if you want something that's just a bit more than fries, you put it between two pieces of bread. <laughs> I mean, you you have heard you so 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 you guys have chip sandwiches. No, I see. As my as my brain is caught in, up because when you say chip, I have to sort of translate. It's like our chip, or yeah. is it yeah, yeah. his chip? Well, but that, yes, that's your chip. Your your chip. I've, I've put okay. I've put potato chips on a sandwich. Yes. I've also put fries on a sandwich. Also, here in California, the 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 California thing to do is put fries in a burrito. Uh, so I guess that's well, a chip I'm from burrito. California, man. We don't do that. What? Yeah, you've never you've never had senior C sig or. Uh, <laughs> That's, uh, That's usually, some kind of hipster San Francisco. Know, but that, thing, usually, so. you know, you get the the burrito with fries in it. Uh, yeah, anyway, but I, yeah. if I did that I, in my I mean, burrito shop or the truck, I, I might get beat on there. You know, because like what? <laughs> that like they'd rush out of the kitchen with a cleaver. Who wants fries in their burrito? That that's what would happen. There's just like no way. <laughs> it's it's actually pretty good. It's in your C really Okay, good, really okay. good. You should try it. You should try it. But, but, but but I mean, you know, a Lay's sandwich is just starch upon starch upon starch. Okay. So I, if you want a starchy meal, it's there. Oh, Add in some sauce and you've got some flavor. I can see that because potato chips in a sandwich is pretty good. American potato chips, yeah. which is your yeah, yeah. crisps. Crisps, yes. <laughs> Crisp, got it. Okay. This is, you know what, this is harder to understand than the whole like Intel 743 <laughs> thing, yeah. I think. We, yeah, I know. I hate it. Uh, also, um, we got a lot of questions about uh, soccer, uh, VC Jester was asking why why American football is better than than your football. Uh, but then also somebody was asking about Prime Directive. Was wanting to know if you know what the hundred is, and I, I looked that up, and it's some sort of cricket thing. Uh, you get a lot of sports questions. Uh, wait, wait, yeah. I got Ian on. I'm gonna I'm gonna lay this one on him. Like last week, I insulted everybody from Philadelphia and from Texas. So I'm I'm gonna help me understand this now. For a long time, as an American. I've always sort of been offended. I never could understand, like, well, they have they call soccer soccer. That's just why don't they call that soccer? Because they already got soccer. We'll call our football football. And then it kind of like one day it just dawned on me in football, in American football, the oval thing. You don't use mm. your you don't use your feet. In fact, if you kick that ball, mm. it's a penalty, right? Yes. If you intentionally kick it downfield, that's a penalty. Why don't but we call American? Long. Yeah, but that's that's a ridiculous that's a, it could be like it could be like eight inches tall too. It could be. I mean, like that's the. Yep. I mean, I I'm just saying we should agree to call American football soccer, and you mm. the rest of the world can keep football for for football. And I've just insulted everybody who watches football, and I like football, but I'm well, just. Well, when so 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 so, the way I the way I think about it, as somebody who grew up in the UK, but I've I've spent a lot of time in the US. I think technically I lived in the US over a decade ago for for three months. I was in I was I was in LA. Um the way the way I separate it is you have football and American football. Right? So they're both called football, but you just call one American football. And because you you also have Aussie rules football, which is something in the middle. And then there's and rugby. Then you have rugby, yeah. <laughs> which is with with yeah, which and is Canadian, which is the real too. football. You know, is the real American football. I'd say rugby is like the next level. No, it's it, it's the, the the way I like to characterize American sports like that. You know, baseball and you know to a certain extent also NBA is you guys are all 
focused on having very discreet plays. Every game is a number of very discreet plays. You're either hiking the ball or you're having another trip up court or you're doing another pitch. And that does that in, that creates so many statistics you can bury your head for days mm-hmm. into the minutiae of individual players That's against like you know, left-handed pitchers. <laughs> Whereas a lot of other sports, cricket is the main exception, are fluid. They stop the time very irregularly when the ball goes out of play. Football, you know, the rest of the world football and rugby is all about fluid play. As in, when you have a 90-minute match in our football, it's expected to last about 90 minutes plus 10 to 15 for the... You guys have an American football game. And uh, yeah, okay, there's, what, 60 minutes of technical on-field play? But it actually lasts about three hours. So, and then in baseball, it doesn't actually have a baseball time. Like eight hours. Jeez. So now, I'm, that's why I love football, American football. I mean, American soccer, which I'm calling. <laughs> the reason is because it is only I don't know sixty minutes. It defines on the clock, time, but there's like two and a half hours of commercials, and then like oh, replays, for you guys, yeah, and then like whoa, well let's just stop here, let's draw on the screen. We gotta actually, we gotta get on the headset now and call back to New Jersey and get that. They gotta look at that play. Meanwhile, let's hear from our sponsor, Coca Cola and Disney. Right, <laughs> that's just so uniquely American. <laughs> which, as a spectator, it has really turned into a, a wonderful consumptive spectator sport for on television soccer when i watch soccer i just get tired because it's like man, it's just can somebody make a goal i mean it's just sort of like they're running around man, they just just somebody so call a timeout tired. i'm just tired watching them running yeah <laughs> right so right, right so that's just a criticism because it feels like a low scoring support as in your your defined achievement for the game is very low single digits usually <laughs> yeah. that's why that in the same way that Americans can get into the minutiae of all the different sports on the stats. You're, you're you're watching you're watching the game for you're watching our version of football for you know effective passes, crosses, set pieces. You're 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 feeling the players regardless of the score. If 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 you're just looking at the score, then um, you may have a gambling problem. <laughs> well, I, I I don't know. I was I was looking through the uh, the app at uh, that. Uh... The Tokyo Games uh, going on, you know, and they were like, "Oh, highlights of you know skateboarding and 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 powerlifting and all this stuff." And then they were like, Hi- "Highlights from from soccer one zero. And I'm like, "Well, that's just one highlight. <laughs> somebody scored." No, no, no. There's not because if somebody goes in for a two footed tackle and takes a leg off, <laughs> dang, okay. that's a highlight. Okay. All right. Or or yeah, or, or if they or if somebody manages to run halfway down the pitch, getting around eight people. And then scores, or or so, or somebody does a backwards uh, a jumping bicycle kick and smacks somebody in the head, <laughs> or 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 take a World Cup a couple of years ago, Zinedine Zidane headbutts the captain of the other team and gets sent off. <laughs> okay, all right, but I, I think Gordon, at least we both can agree uh, that Ian can keep uh, cricket. We don't want anything to do with that, right? The flat bat game, right? Yeah, that's the flat bat yep. game. We don't yep. even don't even want to think about it. Okay, <laughs> I'm uh, trying not to in, insult the entire world. The Verdi's like I think about one fifth of America. I'm probably already insulted. So it happens. Uh, it's, uh, I, I tend to think I'm I'm quite knowledgeable about most sports, at least in terms of rules. There's some that I haven't followed in a while, um, but my main one is Formula One, which I know that Americans mm-hmm. don't really get. Mm-hmm. Um, it's more of a rest of the world thing, oh, as racing. many things are. Racing's, you know, fun. Better no, than NASCAR. One's awesome. I'll, I'll say it's better than NASCAR. <laughs> no, NASCAR. You know, I, I, you know, I used to crew in a on a on a you know club car team, and I there's a special. I have a special place for NASCAR. You, you know, sort of the road racers are always look down their nose at NASCAR because it's just you're just making left turns. But, oh, you get those NASCAR. Oh no, it's. It's difficult. It's difficult, and you get like you go into a turn, and you're like four abreast, and you're going 180 miles an hour. It, it ain't that easy. It's a different kind of scary, but I understand as as road road racers, yeah. you always kind of like ah, whatever. You're just going just turn left. It's like they, your NASCAR. Your left hand must be like really strong, right? Because but you know it's not. It's not that. It's not that. NASCAR is. It's it's with, with ovals. The corner starts half a mile before you think it does. Yeah. <laughs> 
think uh last question uh vegetable stew uh kick something off with uh do you think you'll be able to pub- publicly tease intel's next uh h-e-d-t part out of pat gelsinger you think you'll get him to spill the beans mm. i th- hi so specifically the high-end desktop as in an in a, a, a socket somewhere in between xeon and consumer i i'm i'm of, i'm of the opinion that intel won't enter that market again for another few years properly seriously um i mean uh i i haven't seen exact numbers but i've heard reports where amd's threadripper market is is almost rounds to zero when it comes to <laughs> revenue um <laughs> because it's it's so niche it feels it fills the market for those very specific people but it's not it's not a revenue generation it's a halo show off and for amd it's working great uh, intel has to align with a halo product that works uh, i mean so they just launched ice lake xeons and even if they had an ice lake xeon version of that how many cores would that be? Well, you know, the mid core count is still 28 cores, but they already have Skylake versions of that. And that doesn't really compete against 64 core versions. Yeah, it. I believe that Intel's next attack on high end desktop is probably going to be chiplet based. They're going to have to. And that's only going to be when they have more sort of chiplet through the stack. Meteor Lake, Granite Rapids. That sort of time frame, maybe. But on the comments say, will I tease it? Could I tease it out of Pat Gelsinger? I am i don't believe Pat Gelsinger has even thought about it for one tenth of one second since he started, because <laughs> that's not what he needs to think about. Very one true. of the issues is with these companies is that they management stack from CEO down to base engineer working on you know, low level cash could be 20 people. So while that one person is sitting there, maybe the product person is five above there. You've still got another 15 to get before you get to the CEO. So how much is actually the CEO thinking about it? <laughs> he's, 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 more, he's more thinking about long-term vision, scale, mm. getting the right personnel, saying the right things on camera. Well, that sort of stuff. R- really, they were uh, the so the follow up to that question is is the real question. Uh, do you have any any memorable, quirky, funny stories that happened during your time as a as a journalist? Uh, you know, maybe getting somebody to say something on or off record at a, at a convention or anything. Uh, I was the one that got AMD to set the price of the thirty nine ninety X at three thousand nine hundred and ninety dollars. <laughs> um, as it, you were in that yeah. meeting, I think, yeah. Gordon, weren't no. you? And, and I, I think I got a bit obnoxious because no, I no. completely disagreed. It was a different meeting. That was, well, I can't talk about what happened after that whole thing, but there were there were dual meetings. Yeah. I had the non-3990 price one in my official information. Yeah. And that's, uh, yeah. that's, a, that's a story that, that's a beer, that's over bar story that we can't probably can't talk about. But <laughs> do you think HEDT is, I mean, yeah, they. you're right. It makes sense just like, let's just not go there just to get punched in the face um, until we're ready for a product. Just ignore it. But for AMD, it makes sense to continue to service it though, right? Because I mean, it's just, yeah. they get the, that's their big, bigger bar on stage thing. We're like, hey, we're crushing mm-hmm. dual Xeons that they sell for so much more. And this is just a workstation part. So I can't imagine AMD, yeah. even though it, it doesn't make any money. It's it's just the marketing value of Third Upper has yeah, been yeah, awesome. Yeah. yeah, sure. And great um, t-shirt designs. And good t-shirts. <laughs> uh, it's, there, there was one other thing that you can find the video of. Um, this is Hot Chips. Two years ago, uh, Lisa Sue had the keynote. And at Hot Chips, um, you have keynotes are an hour. You have about 50 minutes of keynote and then 10 of Q&A from the audience. Uh, I woke up and uh, Lisa was talking. Yeah, you know, it was very holistic because it wasn't product related discussion. And I had noticed that earlier that week that there would there'd been a job posting at AMD for a new workstation position, as in head of workstation product. And at that time, they hadn't launched Threadripper three thousand. 
So I so I turned around and I said uh, something along the lines of, you know, AMD. I see this new product line or, or new new listing for a job for a job for workstation. So, what is AMD's commitment to the workstation market as it differentiates from Epic, and what does that mean for product names like Threadripper? The hint to say, you know, and then. And then she said, "Oh, you know, this is a new product announcement, but you'll hear more about Threadripper later in the year." And and I, th I think I said, "When? Uh, or can you be a bit more closer than that?" And she was like, uh, "You know, later this year. Is, is that is that good enough for you?" And I said, "No." <laughs> and the whole audience erupted in laughter. And then uh, somebody shouted behind me, uh, "Get off! Let other people ask questions." <laughs> was that Charlie? <laughs> no. <laughs> It's it's somebody you won't know. Yeah, oh. it's, it's somebody you know, but I won't name them. Um, so yeah, like no, no, she she she, she 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 did say uh, yes. You definitely will hear about it. You know, later this year, and you know, it came out in what November or something. So yeah, oh, that that was fun. That was banter with a CEO at a major event <laughs> <laughs> and publicly. I I wasn't there, but I always think about the time uh, Gordon got Jensen riled up. Oh yeah, uh, that was fun. A couple C CESs ago. Yeah, that was that was a special moment. <laughs> Although, you know, I would point out Ian yesterday, the Intel call. He gets the first call. You get the first question. I was like, well, Ian's always there. You know, they they prioritize Ian, so they do the you know worldwide talk, and you know, Pat Pat takes the first question from from Ian, of course. So. It it's uh they it because that was a webcast. They also had a dial in for the analysts, and I somehow got sent the dial-in information to register. And then I also noticed at the bottom of the stage, it says, press, you know, press this key combination to put your hand up for a question. And I did that right at the start of the webcast. Mm -hmm. So when it came to the end, when they actually gave everybody else the details, mm -hmm. I was first in line. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, game the system. Very uh, good. Ian knows all fun. the tricks. Ian knows all the tricks. So nice. Fun times. Cool. Well, that was a great talk. I, I always enjoy having Ian on because, you know, Ian, he knows his stuff. He knows the stuff uh, we need. And again, uh, you can catch Ian's content over on Tech Tech Potato and, of course, at anontech.com. Good stuff. You know, I mean, you want the, 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 the gold standard for hardware coverage. You go to anontech, so read Ian's stuff over there. But uh, thanks for coming. We got any more last oh, questions? thanks for having me. Should I take us out? No, let's uh, let's get out of here. Ready for some some food? Maybe we'll go get some uh, some burritos with French res in them, or some or, or chips, chips, chip no, buddies. crisps. Wait, chips? Yes, but fried potato with potato chips and crisps. Inside. Oh yeah, yeah. You got mm, okay. There we go. That's the sandwich. You mean a, a chip crisp buddy? Yep. Is that a thing? A crispy probably... chippy buddy. I would call it the crispy it chippy buddy. Yeah. There's probably the, the somewhere. Thing is you, have to, you, have to, you have to voice the T's. As T's rather than D's, because I know some American accents have, you know, they voice the T's as D's. So, but butty. But T. But I'm going to I'm gonna ask for one of those if oh, I ever get over them. And we should put tater tots on it, too. And tater tots. Yeah, we, yeah we should figure out a way to send you tater tots through FedEx. I wonder if it would survive. I guess it probably all. No. <laughs> oh, that's even better. <laughs> you just get a moldy bag oh of tater tots. Oh, my God. That'd be terrible. Tater tots. <laughs> so, we check back. <laughs> we wouldn't do it. Check back next week for your fix of PC Talk on the full, full Nerd. For audio listeners, subscribe to us on iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, or Stitcher. Send questions and comments to thefullnerd at PCWorld.com. And also, please leave a review if you're on one of the services. Every time you do, Ian brings up some obscure potato-related uh, food reference from the UK we don't know about. Thanks for coming. I'm Gordon Young with Dr. Ian Cutris. Good to be here. I'll and be back. Adam Patrick Murray is going to hit the off switch. Uh, thanks, everybody. It was, a, it was a good time. Thank you, Ian. Uh, it was a really good time. And we will see you all next week. Bye.